exoskeletons. These machines promise us more physical strength, more endurance, and they offer a chance to walk for those who can't. So why are you not wearing an exoskeleton right now? Why are we not seeing more of these machines, considering the great benefits promised? Is it just a matter of cost, or is there something else? To answer, we have to explore the limits of today's exoskeletons. And we shall focus on active or powered exoskeletons instead of passive ones, because we have to admit, I have to admit, the coolest exoskeletons are definitely the active ones. Passive exoskeletons are machines that can combine specific materials, springs and dampers to reduce the workload of the users. But powered exoskeletons are electromechanical wonders, wearable machines with electric pneumatic or hydraulic motors that allow or support limb movement. And power machines, power exoskeletons are certainly more complex and massive than passive ones. We're talking about machines that can weigh 10 kilograms or even more. And the fact that these machines are so massive and complex implies the first limitation. They require a power source, which is a big issue, of course, for long-term usage. Different solutions have been considered from the industry, We're talking about internal combustion engine, hydrogen cells, batteries, all these solutions have pros and cons in order to power an exoskeleton, but batteries are the most common solution and the easiest one and probably the most reliable. In terms of duration, it ranges depending on the exoskeleton. For example, the exoskeleton we are looking at right now is the Guardian XO from Sarcos. It's a very bulky exoskeleton meant for heavy lifting and its battery lasts some several hours. But, of course, it depends on the demands of the exoskeleton. An exoskeleton may be fought for assisting people with disabilities. They are less demanding, of course, and they last a little bit more. Talking about applications, we will look at the following applications. Military, industrial and medical exoskeletons. Now, military and industrial exoskeletons have similar purposes. We're talking about machines that are designed to increase strength and endurance of the user and assist the body in lifting and holding heavy weights. The objective is to reduce fatigue and musculoskeletal injuries at, for example, critical areas like the ankles, the knees and the back. And all of this seems really great. I mean, think about, for example, the soldiers. Soldiers can carry up to 50 kg or more of equipment for extended periods when we are in training or in operation. Or think about industrial workers who have to carry and manipulate heavy objects in their daily activities. So we're talking about people who have to do really heavy work and they can experience, of course, fatigue or injuries. Talking about the industry, exoskeletons in the industry are probably the most common application of exoskeletons. Their use has vastly increased in the last few years. For example, in the automotive industry, there has been a surge in the use of exoskeletons. Thing is, in the automotive industry, workers have sometimes to work in unnatural positions, like holding up something up high, and they have to do it for long periods of time, which can lead, of course, to fatigue. In the industry, the exoskeletons adopted are mostly passive, so they are the simple, less demanding, technical solution, but still, even if we have seen great benefits in the industry, there are still some resistances to the adoption of exoskeletons. The first one, and it's very important, is fitting. Exoskeletons are not like clothes. They don't replicate fully human anatomy, because it's pretty complex to replicate human anatomy. Sometimes some joints, like the shoulders, are very difficult to replicate. Exoskeletons have to accommodate the movement by shortening or lengthening. And if an exoskeleton does not fit very well, it can cause discomfort or potential injury. But fitting is not the only danger. For example, it has been observed that prolonged use of exoskeletons can cause deconditioning of trunk muscles with potential muscle loss in the long run. Because of course, if these people are using less the trunk muscles because the workload is allocated to the exoskeleton, then in the long run, these people probably are going to decondition their own trunk muscles. Another danger is due to the fact that wearing an exoskeleton like a heavy, a bulky exoskeleton shifts the center of gravity of the user. And this can affect balance, potentially with the user falling down and hurting himself. Lastly, a very important point has been raised and it's the fact that there is a fear that being able to lift and do more workers will be asked
asked to work harder and longer. Which kind of reminds me about a video that I made about Amazon robotic warehouses. It had been observed in a report that in Amazon robotic warehouses there have been more injuries than normal warehouses because with the presence of robots, productivity targets have risen. And with higher productivity targets, workers have to catch up the pace of the machines and of course there are more injuries. So this is something we have to consider because companies might adopt technologies, new technologies, to boost productivity instead of considering the human needs, which might be left behind. Talking about human needs and health, what about exoskeletons for medical applications? Certainly to me, these are the most interesting and fascinating machines. They're meant for people who have difficulty moving. We're talking about people who have had strokes, spinal cord injuries, or maybe aged people who cannot move very well. With respect to these skeletons used in military or industrial settings, these exoskeletons for medical applications are meant to support body weight and not to lift heavy weights. Also, they're meant to generate the walking motion, the gait, because of course the people cannot work on their own. And it has been observed several times that these exoskeletons, they prove to be greatly beneficial to the patients with great benefits, both physically and mentally. I mean, we're talking about people who have to sit for all of their lives, which of course takes a toll on the human body. And also mentally speaking, the fact that they can walk again is greatly beneficial. So you would imagine that people with these conditions would be super excited to use exoskeletons, right? I mean, walk on your legs instead of relying on a wheelchair. Wheelchairs are very functional and fast machines, but they have obvious limitations, unfortunately. Then why, however, are exoskeletons for medical applications so rare compared to industrial exoskeletons? Not considering the cost, there are still several issues that have to be solved. And this is why we're not seeing all patients affected by paraplegia using an exoskeleton. The first issue is gait generation. Now, for a person who is fortunate enough to be able to walk on their legs, moving a leg seems a very easy task. I mean, it's something that has been proven by nature for millions of years. It has worked pretty well for us humans because our body has evolved to do that. But in fact, when we have to replicate this movement, moving a leg with a machine, it turns out to be a very complex control problem. Because we have to remember, these people have spinal cord injuries or other injuries, and sometimes they don't have neural feedback, they don't have any feedback coming from the legs, so they have simply no control on the legs. And this is completely taken on the exoskeleton. And managing the movement of all these joints, several different joints, at different angles and at different speeds, is very complicated. The second problem is balance. Again, these people have difficulty moving and exoskeletons do not usually help that much with things like feet placement and body posture, which are very important in balance. When the exoskeleton actuates and moves, the patients sometimes have difficulty balancing. And for this reason, patients that use exoskeletons, they need crutches plus supervision during walking activities, which of course limits the autonomy of movement of the patients. Talking about crutches, we raise the third problem, practicality. Because if you use a crutch, if you use crutches, your hands are busy. And in addition to balance, in addition to this, for some exoskeletons, crutches are actually very important because it's where the input device is placed. The patients can control the movement of the exoskeleton via buttons and screens, which are located in the handles of the crutches. Researchers are working on hands-free solutions that free the patients for the need of providing commands via the crutches. Some ways of providing commands in another way are under study, but they are considered less reliable for the moment. I'm talking about things, for example, like brain-computer interfaces which is a very exciting technical solution. We've seen it during Neuralink presentation, for example. We've seen it that these potential technical solutions might enable people to control prosthetics or exoskeletons with their thought. The patient would control the exoskeleton simply by thinking about moving a leg. The device would extract control information from the brain and use it to move the exoskeleton. But unfortunately for the moment, this is still not fully possible and the commercial exoskeletons still need crutches. So patients with spinal cord injury Injuries must still prefer the wheelchair because at least with a wheelchair, even with its limitation, they can use their hands while they're moving around. And lastly, the fourth problem is applicability. The thing is, unfortunately, not all patients with spinal cord injuries can use exoskeletons because if your injury is too high, that is, if the vertebra that is affected is too high, 
it means that a greater portion of the trunk is affected. As you probably know, if you have a spinal cord injury, depending on the height of your damage, you have less or more control over your trunk movements. So if the vertebra affected is very high, you have very limited control over your upper body movement and you cannot use an exoskeleton. You don't have enough strength, enough control to use an exoskeleton. In fact, you require a certain strength in the upper body to use an exoskeleton, for example, to stabilize yourself and to use the crutches. So we have still a very long way to go for exoskeletons, but the progress is undeniable and it's incredible to see these videos. For medical exoskeletons, for example, it is incredible to see the results. I was amazed to see these people walking, because if you can walk, of course, this seems very obvious, I mean, very simple and easy, but if you cannot, if these people cannot move their legs and they can with exoskeletons, and this is amazing. So let me know your thoughts, and in particular, if you have ever tried an exoskeleton, let me know your experience. I thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, think about subscribing, and see you next time.